Welcome back. Now, the federal government has warned organized labor to consider the broader economic implications of its push for what it calls an unrealistic higher national minimum wage. The Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohamed Idris, who handed down the admonition, hinted that the 250,000 naira minimum wage demanded by labor could actually undermine the economy, lead to mass retrenchment of workers, and jeopardize the welfare of Nigerians. However, the labor unions have refuted President Bola Tinubu's claims that during his Democracy Day broadcast on Wednesday that an agreement had been reached on the new national minimum wage. Now, recall that by the time negotiations ended on June the 7th, no consensus had been reached by the tripartite committee of the national minimum wage. The parties had actually engaged in, a pro in prolonged talks now for weeks with the unions ins insisting on 250,000 naira minimum wage, while the federal government and the organized private sector eventually settled for 62,000 naira. But of course, I should say state governors on their part have said they cannot even afford to pay 60,000 naira. In response, President Tinubu says his administration would soon submit an executive bill to the National Assembly aligning the agreements uh, reached in the minimum wage negotiations between labor, the private sector, the states, and the federal government. But the question is, which agreement exactly is the president talking about and what exactly is the amount we're talking about here? Let's discuss this some more. I'm now being joined on the program by uh, Mr. Dewale Ajadi, who is uh, a public affairs analyst. He joins us from uh, London. Mr. Ajadi, thank you very much for coming on the program. Um, it, it appears there's a log jam here. The president saying that uh, he is going to submit uh, the national minimum wage bill now to uh, the National Assembly. And then in his Democracy Day speech, um, saying that an agreement had been reached. And then the labor unions coming out to say, look, no agreement has been reached yet. For them, it's 250,000 naira or nothing. And then, on another hand, you have the governor saying they, are, they can't even afford to pay 60,000 naira. Well, this is perfectly understandable because this is about perspectives that are contradictory in some ways. Um, I, I genuinely think that setting the minimum wage over 200,000, even over 100,000, would be catastrophic for Nigeria. Um, because it's not just the wage for the person, the individuals that were earned the wage, but it will set a tone um, for the rest of the economy where other people would want to maximize their profit in ratio. And that's not sustainable. Well, there is a difference between what can, we can produce and support and what is the aspiration of individuals. And remember, we're talking about minimum wage. We're not talking about maximum wage. Um, there, is, there, there is grave danger because prices will go through the roof. There is no doubt about that. Uh, and and some you... would argue that we, we have not even recovered from Udoji Award many decades ago. <laughs> to think about we are going to do this right now. Yeah, and, and, yes, I'm, I'm, and, and I'm happy that... I'm, I'm happy you pointed that out, that we're talking about minimum wage here and we're not talking about maximum wage because the truth is what most people don't understand is that, look, this is minimum wage, but eventually people could still be paid more than this. And in any case, that you can have a situation where anyone is paid less than whatever the minimum wage is, but people can actually be paid more than that and that these affects almost every other worker. So if you have situations, as we speak now, we probably wouldn't have a situation where a worker is earning that exact minimum wage. They definitely will be earning more than that. And, and that's the mathematics that we're, we're talking about here, right? And we have, we have a large-scale issue of employment, productive employment. Who's going to build the car? Who's going to be willing to pay 200 and something thousand? Let's talk about the private sector. How are they going to sustain this? The market is not going to be able to carry this. Um, it, it's not just government workers that are going to do this. I mean, people like me who have domestic workers are going to have to pay them mm. because in principle, we will not pay them less than the minimum wage. Yeah, so mm. just be ready for somebody who is driving you to get about half a million pounds, half a million naira because they wouldn't get the minimum wage. They'll get more than that. Now, for, for, for they're this... already 
How do you think that of the state governments now should be handled? Uh, as we speak today, uh, going by the Constitution, the issue of minimum wage is in the exclusive list, not even in the concurrent list. So st it's like states have no say, so to speak, other than this tripartite committee that we're talking about now, or maybe during the negotiation. But you look at the Constitution, everything rests with the federal government. And, and you know, there have been suggestions that isn't it time states are allowed to negotiate their own minimum wage. And, and don't you think, um, you know, this current stalemate probably should, should lead to that, um, uh, uh, that process where uh, the, the constitution is amended so the states can actually begin uh, to determine their own minimum wage since the states are not, um, you know, you can't determine, their, their wealth is not equal at all. Well, and cost of living is not equal. Equal. Cost of living in um, in in um, Jaws is not cost of living in Abuja. Um, so true. when you do the minimum made wage by fiat like that, the person in Jaws will be earning the same as the person in Abuja. The cost of the person in Jaws is probably about half the cost of the person in Abuja mm -hmm. or Ibadan, for that matter. <laughs> so you know you you would be richer in Ibadan on the same salary. Um, it, 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 it's an abstraction. Um, but actually, we have a problem with regards to the states. One would not be worried if the state governments themselves were actually as responsible and as accountable as they ought to be. Mm. Then you know that whatever is achieved at the state level is not just some kind of whiff of some kind of um, whiff, uh, fiefdom and power abuse, but it will be some legitimate economic reality. But to be honest with you, the states are not accountable to that point that you give them additional powers. Um, they, re they rarely even pay the existing salary, not to talk about this new one that has been suggested. Um, it's a difficult one. And to be honest with you, if there was a very technical solution, then I would suggest it. But I don't think there is a technical solution to this. Because on the other side of it, when you look at labor's argument in terms of um, a living wage and all of that. Mm. You can understand and you can empathize with their position. But the timing is wrong. The country is dealing with severe inflationary trends that are actually devastating everybody, every part of the marketplace. If you increase the, 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 the wage at any level, you're going to increase the cost of operation. And that means that people are not going to start new businesses. People who have existing businesses will not employ more for quite some time. And everybody is going to have to cut their cloth according to their, 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 cloth, their, their size according to their cloth or whatever is the right phrase. Mm. So it's, um, it's going to be quite challenging for a while. So, I don't so think you... the timing is right. I don't think the timing for a wage increase is right. But I, I understand why Labour wants it. So, so you think we, we might be looking at another strike here because uh, obviously Labour has said it is not going to shift ground and uh, to, to be candid, I, even sitting right here, I find it difficult to see how the government can actually pay what Labour wants and um, even, uh, you know, private sector employers too, I, I find it difficult to see how they can do that. Not quite long ago, we spoke with the uh, Director General of NECA, that's uh, the National uh, Employers Consultative Association, and they said, uh, as a matter of fact, what they settled for initially was 60000 and that that was even sacrificial. And if you look at what businesses are going through in the country at the moment, I'm just wondering. Um, so, so, I mean, with Labour not willing to shift ground, we might be looking at another strike, and, and that, of course, would have devastating effect on, on the economy. Well, also, there'll be severe layoffs. I mean, it's, 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 it's not sustainable. The truth about it is that this is the kind of paternalistic society that would damage us. Um, but I also understand that people are struggling. Um, we have to empathize with that perspective. And somewhere along the line, Labour has to understand that this economy is not... You see, it, what would be great, I'm sorry to reverse things, is, to, mm. is for us to be able to judge things on productivity. And if we can measure ourselves on what we are producing and looking at the productivity of individuals, then we can say our economy is productive enough to carry this. These are not being done on productivity indicators. These are being done on the basis of, oh, this is what our people need.
And those needs are even if you raise the if you even if you raise the the, the 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 wages, then the costs are going to increase exponentially as well. And so mm. whatever it is they get will be lost in the marketplace. So we, we really need to find a different way of doing this and calibrating this. But because the main drivers of this are in the civil service, they're not in the private sector. The main interest of labor, or the main people in labor, are in the, are in the civil service, they're in the government service of some sort. Mm. So productivity indicators are nonsensical to them. I, I, I'm speculating, of course. No, it's, it's not a question of speculation. I mean, it, it's, it's something we know anyway. I mean, it's something we know. We, we, have, we have a situation where, you know, in most government, uh, I would say, you know, government workers are not even able to, to generate the funds they need to pay themselves. It's, it's just the truth. We see that. Uh, so we, we, we can't deny that. Um, but, but going forward, how, how do you think this can be resolved without labor going on strike? I, I, you know, there's no short-term solution, uh, to be honest with you, that I can see. And maybe that's because I am blinded to this. Um, and I, I can consider that whether I'm being an economist doesn't solve the, the ample gap in data mm. that allows one to really look at this. There are serious gaps in our data. Um, but I can, put, I can suggest a, a medium to longer-term solution, which is a, a labor market that is driven by the realities of what is required in the market. Right now, the labor market is not driven. Even people going to school is not driven by the, what is needed in the market. market. If the market is driven properly, which means that we know what are the areas and jobs that we need, we know that before people go to school, this is areas where we can pay premium price to them because we don't have them, the scarcity in the market and all of that then we can start to make intelligent choices about the cost of labor, about what we are willing to pay premium prices for in the marketplace, and what, we are, what government is willing to pay. You just mentioned something very powerful. What level of revenue is being generated by, by government workers? When you don't generate the revenue, you know, and, and, and the taxes are not coming, Nigeria has some of the lowest tax paying um, to GDP ratios in the world. And we're talking about offloading on government, all these things, and we're not even talking about the large bills we get with corruption running rich large, you know? So really, we're not running a tight ship at all. We're just running a, you know, a speculative ship. We need to run a tighter ship so that when government says we can't pay this, these are the reasons why we can't pay. We have looked at our figures of last year, this is what came in. This is what is going out. This is what we can afford to pay. But once you're not having that conversation, anybody who's lacking things in their house can say, well, we put the pressure on the government. So mm -hmm. government has to get its act together. Labor has to get its act together. Let's start talking on the basis of data. And then maybe we can get a win-win solution. Thank you very much for coming on the program. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Don't go away. Opinions are free. Facts are sacred. The truth is universal. How, in practical terms, can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? Because when you go into public office, you must be ready to answer to the people. We know where the enemy is. Three places. Um, the Lake Chad Basin the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the Sambisa Forest. On Digi 360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion, facts, and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians are saying in this uh, part of the world. A new Nigeria is possible, a future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it, so that you can understand it, and use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for go any governor to look for grant for ranching. Digi360, dissecting the issues.